thank you for being here this afternoon. Uh, my name is Inder Paul <coughs> and along with my colleague Hazel Harvey, we are co-conveners of this Frankie seminar on race and caste. So it is my very, very great pleasure to introduce Professor Rao today. Um, professor Rao is Tao Associate Professor of History at Barnard College and Columbia University. She received her PhD from the Interdepartmental Program in Anthropology and History at the University of Michigan, which no longer is. It's there. It's there. Okay. <laughs> I was worried. It looked really it's so great. Um, she is also an acting director of the Institute for Comparative Literature and Society and organizer of the annual Ambedkar Lectures at Barnard and Columbia. Right. Professor Rao has written widely on the themes of colonialism and humanitarianism and on non-Western histories of gender and sexuality. Her book, The Caste Question, theorized caste and Dalit <coughs> activism with specific focus on the history of anti-caste thought and its thinkers and producing alternative genealogies of political subject formation. She's written numerous other essays. She's edited several volumes on the topic of caste and Dalit uh, history as well. But in, in general, I would say her work is remarkable from the way that she thinks about producing the history of the Dalit public sphere and thinking about Dalit intellectual history. And her work has become really seminal in any understanding of that history of Dalit thinking in India. The caste question engages with Dalit emancipation and new forms of power and subjection that appear in colonial and post-colonial India. And in her book, The Caste Question, which is an amazing and wonderful book, um, she takes us from British colonial governance to the backlash of the contemporary reservation system in post-colonial India. She tracks through Dalit intellectual thought and activism how bureaucratic responses produce different ways to think the political subjectivity of Dalits. And she looks particularly at questions of violence and of subjection, right? Thinking of what violence is unspeakable or indecipherable. Such violence, she argues in that book, are characteristic of the making of Dalit subjectivities in shifting ways, subjectivities that are both stigmatized and revolutionary. Right? And she's at work following that amazing, brilliant book and all of the editorial uh, work she's been doing on three other projects, R.B. More, More, I wasn't sure, Memoirs of a Dalit Communist, another entitled Ambedkar in his time and hours, and a third on Dalit Bombay stigma, precarity, and everyday life. We're delighted to have her with us today. Her talk is entitled Historical Comparison, Social Abstraction, Thinking Caste, Race, Gender in the Time of Capital. Please join me in welcoming Professor Rao. Thank you um, so very much. Uh, I'm really thrilled to be here. I, please give me just a second and then I'll start talking. Um, but I also just want to, I have this up on a loop and so this will go around a few times. As I said, this is a non, the first slide is necessary. It gives you a sense of the, um, the shape of the talk that I'm going to give. But the rest of the slides are uh, images for entertainment. They are disaggregated from my talk, um, so you can view them. They will come around a few times. They're connected and they're interlinked to what I'll be saying, but they're not absolutely essential. That is to say, I'm not using the slides to make an argument that is connected to the, um, the, to the talk that I'll be reading. Um, so with that said, um, it's really a great, great pleasure for me to be here. And I'd like to thank Hazel Carby and Inderpal Grewal fellow travelers and pathfinders for inviting me. Thanks also to the Whitney Humanities Center and to the Frankie family for making these engagements in public humanities possible. The semester long exploration of caste and race, I understand, is engaged or interested in thinking through the peculiar affinities, the missed meetings and the awkward correspondences uh, between caste and race, each a peculiar agent of transformation, 
each offering a way to think the human indifference and each predicating the imagination of equality on rethinking the relationship between embodiment and the universal. As I thought about my presentation today, it seemed apt to try to exemplify a method that thinks about the problem of comparison, of equivalence and commensuration across analytic levels, and to do so by thinking the supplementarity of caste and race, the one calling up the other as if to embrace a forgotten twin. This is what I'm going to present is a little experimental because I'm going to be choosing some sites for conversation and hopefully we can link them together in, the, in, in our Q&A. But I want to begin with my own personal history of moving from Bangalore to Chicago South Side as a point of entry into broader questions about historical comparison, questions of space, colonial capital, and how the social abstractions of capital enabled an insurgent globality, one that was predicated on the right to think and imagine anew including connections across race and caste. I adopt this mode of disjunctural reading, of reading across specific histories of destitution, deprivation, and remaking, to give you a sense of time, place, and the problem at hand. I hope you'll witness something like an instantiation of this method, as I said, of disjunctive comparison along the way. I said I was going to begin with personal, uh, uh, with personal history, but of course, we know that autobiography is never quite what we think it is. Recall Du Bois's Dusk of Dawn, published in 1940 with the subtitle Autobiography of a Race Concept, which uses the self as an example for broader reflection on being and on thinking. Or the fact that the other person that I will focus on somewhat today, Biyar Ambedkar, resisted the self-exposure preferred by his intimate agon, M.K. Gandhi, and who outed himself only episodically and one might say in his marginal writings. So uh, my talk today is going to be framed around two broad uh, questions or problematics. One is to think about the question of worlding, that is to think about the world made anew in the context of the late 19th century and the transformations and the reorientation of global capital in that moment. And then I want to relate that to the question of thought. This first section is called Inhabitation Connected Worlds. I was conducting historical research on Bombay, its subaltern neighborhoods, and the question of social housing. That is, I was thinking about Bombay as a paradoxical site for the experience of social emancipation and a catalyst for new forms of outcasting and exclusion when my partner and I decided to buy an apartment in New York some years ago. Like everyone who buys property in New York City, we found ourselves negotiating a maze of legal regulations that elaborated a fundamental contradiction between viewing one's home as an economic asset on the one hand and viewing housing or the home as shelter or refuge on the other. The process of making home was pleasurable, but it was also fraught. It brought back vivid memories of the home I'd left behind in 1979 when my family moved from India to the United States. That house in Bangalore occupied a large corner plot. It was designed by my England returned engineer father with a taste for natural ventilation and quality materials. I remember the polished teak and rosewood inside as I, do the as I do the coconut, pomegranate, and guava trees outdoors. But most of all, I'm reminded now that this was a South Indian Brahmin home, its secular modernity co cohabiting quite easily with signs of caste. I arrived in Chicago when I was 10, and for the next decade, it was the geography of the city's south side that organized my world. This was the world of the prairie shores and lake meadows high rises along Lakeshore Drive. The one stately homes now burned out or boarded up along Indiana Avenue as one made one's way into Hyde Park. And the one way streets and brownstones that surrounded the University of Chicago where I'd gone to school and where there was always talk in hushed tones about no go areas like the Midway Plaisance. It was as if the city's segregated history indexed a deep violence that could incapacitate thought unless we could keep it at arm's length. And so we did. Many of us embraced European thought and theory. In the process, we forgot that the University of Chicago was the birthplace of <laughs> urban sociology, the famous Chicago School, and the Cust School of Race Relations. The Chicago School's focus on the city as a social laboratory had produced a number of fine-grained studies of unions, race relations, housing, transport, and much else. However, the university's own efforts at social engineering was rarely acknowledged, although evidence of its destruction of a once thriving African-American neighborhood was all around us. 
My memories of Bangalore only make sense when placed against the contrasting experience of Chicago's South Side. Much as the story of our real estate acquisition in New York called to mind ongoing research on housing in Bombay. It's as if the cross-referencing of historical geographies and personal itinerary, not to mention the apparent convergence between historically distinct and logically disjoint spatial processes, constituted a mode of critical reading. It's a mode of reading that sees comparison as both politically necessary and methodologically insufficient. Such reading is insufficient because comparison always introduces the idea of a developmental norm against which objects are compared. Yet comparison also enhances political perception. When we compare X with Y, we're also asking how X was produced, why X appears to be lacking when it's compared with Y, or how it is that X and Y, though they are different, appear to have been produced by similar processes. Historical comparison is vice versa. What links India to the United States? What links Chicago and Bombay? Is it possible to trace moments of historical convergence when the two spaces came to be constituted by similar social forces and economic processes? The restructuring of the colonial economy was one such moment when loss of British access to American cotton spurred the growth of Bombay as an important imperial hub that developed around the cotton economy and linked the city with its hinterland through new technologies of travel, labor migration, and environmental transformation. Chicago's rise as a modern city was enabled by the fire of 1871, which had created a rare opportunity for urban zoning on modern planning, as did Bombay's bubonic plague of 1896. These connections are conjunctural, but the consequences are visible and long-lasting. In the aftermath of their natural disasters, both Chicago and Bombay came to be associated with forms of stigmatized housing, the ghetto and the slum, respectively, which instantiate broader processes of labor mobilization <coughs> and which regulated social difference through the, sp uh, through the segregation of space. The political geographer David Harvey suggests that the modern city is a space of political pacification, where urban dispossession has been accomplished through what he calls repeated bouts of urban restructuring through creative destruction. And that this is a process that almost always has a class dimension, since it's the poor, the underprivileged, and the marginalized uh, who suffer first and foremost from this process. We can argue, it seems to me, that these urban revolutions are racializing processes as well, as they surely are. You know well the mass migration of African Americans from Mississippi and the Carolinas to urban centers in the Midwest and the Northeast. Of, uh, 1.5 million migrated in the period between 1910 and 1930. A further 3 million had migrated from 1940 to 1960, leading to a scarcity of housing in northern cities. The legislated, the legislated right to property ownership was secured via practices of redlining and racial covenanting. These were financial instruments that enabled the social exclusion of African Americans and had precluded their accumulation of private property through exclusion from credit markets. Indeed, the politics of home ownership and the desire for residents in non-segregated or mixed race neighborhoods continues to structure the anxious everyday of a socially mobile black bourgeoisie. Meanwhile, the African American working poor and the underclass would come to be largely concentrated in the ghetto a symbol of urban outcasting, a consequence of the structured exclusion of African Americans from the uh, housing market, and what I think of as a kind of incarcerated space uh, of housing. Similar processes were at work in Bombay too, but with rather different effects. The bubonic plague in Bombay of 1896 had provided uh, colonial administrators with an alibi for demolishing vast swaths of the central city. The plague had also allowed planners and government officials to undertake mass, mass demolitions, followed by experiments in urban governance and industrial housing. Unhygienic housing was raised, and the Bombay City Improvement Trust was established to oversee construction of poor and worker housing. An important experiment in public-private partnership, one that was rather extraordinary for its time, was undertaken, enabled by the use of eminent domain for urban land acquisition, while money to purchase land in working class areas and by the government 
was realized through the sale of areas beyond the city's limit to individual investors who land banked and later used that land to erect <coughs> middle class housing colonies in the interwar period. So that if you go north in Bombay, as anybody who's been there knows, you actually see the central part of the city, which is the kind of area of labor, uh, followed by middle class housing and then suburbs and so on. It's ironic, but the immediate result of such social engineering in Bombay via authoritarian policy was housing scarcity. More homes were demolished than constructed after the plague, and Bombay never caught up. Most of you will know that over 60% of Bombay's residents today are categorized as living in slums. Perhaps we can call them <coughs> self-housing. As a 1921 Industrial Disputes Committee observed, the heaviest burden which uh, labor has to bear in Bombay arises from the deficiency of housing accommodation and the low quality of much that's available. Rather than housing that incarcerated the racial poor, the ghetto or the project, as in the United States, visual anarchy, enabled by demographic density and non-standardized construction, self-housing, the slum, prevailed. Thus, efforts to control labor produced distinctive infrastructures of inequality in the interwar. They produced housing types and urban landscapes that reproduced the logic of spatial segregation with enduring consequence. I'm suggesting here that the connection between the problem of so-called Negro housing and worker housing in Bombay is a counterintuitive one. It suggests divergent outcomes for what was in effect uh, a global problematic, urban pacification in the context of industrial unrest in the interwar. Urban exclusion in North American cities was produced by the right to housing as a racialized right, one that was co-produced by the protection of private property rights on the one hand and complemented by corporal violence and policing on the other. Meanwhile, Bombay's urban landscape was distinguished by policies that actively produced housing scarcity. This generated practices of self-housing with the working poor engaged in the production of informal housing for themselves in the context of government apathy. The significant issue here is that unlike the racial model of incarcerated housing, what we see here is rough sleeping, homelessness, unhoming, uh, the episodic movement between formal and informal housing and self-housing, that is slum living, as a response to state policy. Since planning entails unplanning, they exist in tension and always generate something left over in the process those remainder disposable lives, which constitute something like the excess of planning. Now these connections between India and the United States go back earlier than the interwar, of course, and they go back to the linkages of the Cotton Kingdom. The section is called Social Abstraction, Radical Empiricism, Cotton. In his chapter eight uh, of The Souls of Black Folk, entitled In the Quest of the Golden Fleece, W.E.B. Du Bois writes, have you ever seen a cotton field white with harvest, its golden fleece hovering above the black earth, like a silvery cloud edged with dark green, its bold white signals wa waving like the foam of billows from Carolina to Texas across that black and human sea? I've sometimes half suspected that here the winged ram, Chrysomalus, left that fleece after which Jason and his Argonauts went vaguely wandering into the shadowy east 3,000 years ago. And now the Golden Fleece is found, not only found, but in its birthplace woven. For the hum of the cotton mills is the newest and the most significant thing in the New South today. As I've said earlier, problems faced by British industry in procuring cotton from the American South during the Civil War led to the opening of colonial markets in Egypt and India, which was aided by steam shipping across the Suez. The rich black soil of the Khandesh and Bera region was given over to cotton, while technologies for rationalizing production and accelerating the circulation of Bombay cotton created new linkages between rural hinterland and the city, between Bombay and the British Empire. Though the end of the Civil War saw a sharp drop in demand for global, global cotton, there was no dip in revenue demand, even though Western India and Southern India were then also in the grip of drought and famine. These factors were directly responsible for the infamous Deccan riots of 1877. Rural dispossession became a major cause for migration to Bombay, 
which then was followed by the bubonic plague that emptied out the city in 1896. The anti-caste activist Jyotirao Phule, 1827 to 1890, describes this world in vivid detail. His attention to agrarian distress as the combined outcome of native rent-seeking and colonial surplus extraction is remarkable. So too his sensitivity to peasants' enforced mobility and the urban-rural linkages that structured, structured the colonial economy of the time. He writes in the past, these farmers had very little land and could not survive on its produce. They'd go into the nearby forest, gather wood, fruit, and leaves. Now if they want to fill their bellies, they have to work in the factories as weavers, ironsmiths, or carpenters, or as casual laborers. In Gulamgiri, slavery dedicated to Abraham Lincoln and the good people of the United States, Fule notes that the Indian peasant, and I quote, has in fact been a proverbial milch cow. It was sufficient for their purposes that they held him safe in their clutches for squeezing out of him as much as they possibly could. Fule goes on to link agrarian distress with various states of transient and impoverished existence and notes that many farmers who can't subsist on their fields any longer will leave home and become vagrant, wandering around and working for wages in a big city instead of starving. Fule's description deline delineates key aspects of the agrarian sensorium. The alienation of rural labor from its own labor power is depicted in Fule's world by figures such as the moneylender, who indexed the commodification of social relations in a colonial economy. His world, writings describe a world of routinized deprivation with uh, specific attention to figures that embody vulnerability and impoverishment. His vignette about a day in the life of a farmer merges an account of deformed bodies with depictions of a depleted, unhygienic environment. The women's clothes are in tatters and they're forced, forced to wear ancient bedsheets bought for marriage. And under the tzafa tree, there are a few children dancing half naked with all manner of stain, uh, stains on their bodies, noses uh, running, sweating and stinking, playing with lumps of mud. I'm going to turn this off. I think you've got a sense of what this is. Okay. A pada, or a poem, written shortly after by the president of the Bombay Sri Somanshi Mitra Samaj, which was a reformist organization for uh, Dalits in the city, uh, written by one Pandit Kondiram, ends with the powerful image of Mahar children sitting on a dung heap, their bodies covered with ash, sores on their eyes, rags covering their buttocks, their stomachs sunken and empty. Like Fule's detailed description of the cultivator's life, Kondiram's attention to the wretched condition of the Mahars utilizes social description, what I've called radical empiricism, as the practice of imminent critique. This is the world that Jairus Banaji also calls up in his important study of the commodification of agriculture in the 19th century Deccan a study that details the subjugation of Indian small peasantry to the usury capital of Marwari and Gujarati merchants, as well as a nascent capitalist class that was emerging from the big peasantry in the Deccan. The argument here, which is an engagement with the logic of real and formal subsumption, uh, is an argument uh, that this process would repurpose prior modes of production so that they could perform in a different historical environment but nevertheless serve the requirements of surplus extraction. Essentially, Banaji is arguing, peasant indebtedness to local money lenders had alienated them from the means of production, and it could be argued that like the industrial proletariat, the peasant too was now working for a wage. Agrarian indebtedness, rather than a sign of backwardness, was the historically specific mode by which the peasant received a wage for his own reproduction, whether in the form of an advance um, on crop to be delivered, or as a share of uh, the crop. In essence, under conditions of colonial capitalism then, peasant production for a global market, coupled with uh, his reliance on usurious loans for basic survival, meant that the peasant had in essence become dependent on the capitalist and that he had become a worker. We may also wish to recall Du Bois' own focus in The Souls of Black Folk on the debt economy. He writes, the country is rich, yet the people are poor. The keynote of the black belt is debt. Not commercial credit, but debt in the sense of continued inability on the part of the mass of the population to make income cover expense. 
This, he argues, is the direct heritage of the South, uh, um, of the wasteful economies of the slave regime, but that this was brought to crisis by the emancipation of the slaves. In his discussion then of colonial capitalism, Banaji engages with the specific forms of abstraction to which capitalist society gives rise, but he's also alert to the difference. The difference here I uh, suggest to you is debt rather than accumulation. And when we think of social abstraction, of course, we should think uh, about Marx's explanation of how the commodity form comes to stand in for social relations of exchange and exploitation so that a critique of social life necessarily proceeds through the critique of political economy. When anti-caste thinkers like Foule posited the relationship between personhood and property, and I just want to draw your attention to these remarkably different yet simultaneous modes of exploring this debt economy of the Deccan right around the same time, one thinking through what I've called radical empiricism, the, the other really engaging, in a sense, the arguments of theoretical Marxism, but with a, albeit with a difference. So to come to Foule, who posited the link between personhood and property, a relationship that was crucial to the birth of modern uh, subjectivity, we note that Foule, like other anti-caste thinkers, does so negatively, forefronting degradation, humiliation, impoverishment, and destitution as governing conditions of social life. For them, caste and capital, like race and labor, were mutually entailed. They produced new forms of immis immis immiseration, enabled practices of predation, and required new practices of naming as description and indeed as analysis. We could think here of Foulet's analysis uh, or the renaming of the Shudra Atishudra as an ethical collective, that is the collective of lower castes and Dalits, the repurposing of figures associated with anti-caste critique for a vernacular Marxism, where impoverished or destitute bodies were named or called out in their multiplicity and difference, we could think of B.R. Ambedkar's naming of the untouchable as Dalit, ground down, crushed, broken, versus Gandhi's reclamation of uh, the untouchable as Harijan. Or indeed, W.E.B. Du Bois's use of, the term, uh, of terms such as color caste or abolition democracy, terms which conjugate a specific history against normative political terms and concepts. And in a sense, this harkens back to that uh, opening quote that I began with uh, by Judith Butler. So these terms were enabled, and the renaming was enabled, and the life worlds behind them made thinkable, I suggest, through the paradoxical proximity of empire and emancipation. Here, race and labor, or caste and labor, could appear as two sides of the same coin, the one animating the other. This political economic approach saw the intersection of economic exploitation in historically contingent and evolving forms, and political domination, which reinforced and enabled labor appropriation as mutually entailed bases of racial injustice or caste injustice and inequality. So what so so I suggest that you know so this 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 part on worlding is trying to create something like the material conditions for the forms of solidarity then that become thinkable and imaginable. So the section is called caste race, race caste solidarities. And I just want to briefly go through uh, a, a few ways in which caste had appeared in uh, the discussions around race from the late 19th century as uh, something that was helpful for understanding what would come to be called the aristocracy of color. Now caste had been present from the 19th century in the work of abolitionists who appear to have got it from missionary discourse. We see Frederick Douglass, William Lloyd Garrison, Sojourner Truth using the term caste. Charles, and we know Charles Sumner's famous 1869 lecture on caste, which was delivered a year before the 15th Amendment to the US Constitution, which enfranchised black males, using an argument about uh, the history of caste as a way to understand US racial hierarchy. Viewing caste here as an artificial discrimination born of impossible fable, one that was for ages the dominating institution of ancient India, Egypt, Persia, Assyria, and ancient Greek societies, Sumner arg provides a detailed description of the caste orders and analogizes it with US racial hierarchy. He argues here the caste claiming hereditary rank and privilege is white, the caste doomed to hereditary degradation and disability is black or yellow. 
and therefore the white man is superior, is a superior caste, not unlike the Brahmin, while the black man is an inferior caste, not unlike Shudra, sometimes even the Pariah. Um, there is Catherine Impey's international journal called Anti-Caste, which was published between 1888 to 1893 and again in 1895 which republished and excerpted articles and speeches from newspapers from, among other places, the US, England, and India. And I'm drawing some of this uh, from the work of Demetrius Udell. Um, and Udell draws our attention to the fact that Impey modeled her journal on Booker T. Washington's more moderate publication, The Southern Letter. And of course, Booker T. Washington and the experiments with vocational education are really uh, profoundly important. Uh, it is something that Gandhi, for instance, is aware of, and uh, so on and so forth. And so there's a kind of global spread of many of these experiments. And then we can come to Robert Park, a central figure in the then emergent field of sociology at the University of Chicago, connecting back with the Chicago I knew. Uh, who uses caste as a prism to understand race relations in the US. While this paradigm was adopted by some scholars uh, iconically in uh, Myrtle's highly influential The American Dilemma, The Negro Problem and Modern Democracy, we see others such as the uh, Caribbean sociologist R Oliver Cromwell, Cromwell Cox, who also trained at the Chicago School of Sociology, rejecting what he identified as the caste school of race relations. And in his caste class and race of 1948, he argues that what Myrtle and others do is to reduce the systemic character of white supremacy to a moral dilemma thesis. The notion that the American Negro problem is a problem, in a sense, which is in the heart or which is a kind of moral problem uh, for white America. Um, and, uh, and this would be something that, you know, is, is, a, is an argument that gets picked up, Cox's argument gets picked up well after um, his time, and it gets picked up in the 1960s in the systemic, structural, and institutional analyses of racism, with many people picking up, I think, on two key terms. One is the notion of internal colonization or colonialism which is a term that's used to think about race and uh, racial difference and racial stigmatization in the United States. And the second, of course, is just the term institutional racism itself. Uh, we can also think, I think, uh, I think about uh, historians, George Fredrickson being the most, I think, famous, who writes in White Supremacy about connections between the United States and South Africa. And again, the argument here being an argument about uh, racial supremacy or white supremacy. Uh, which is explicitly the model that Fredrickson uses to connect these spaces. And I could draw attention to a few other productions of the caste school of race relations. There's Lloyd Warner's American Caste and Class, published in 1936. Bob Gallagher's American Caste and the Negro College, uh, published in 1938. John Dollard's famous text, Caste and Class in a Southern Town, written in 1937. Lloyd Warner and Alison Davis's critique of Dollard in a comparative study of American caste, where they draw on people like Boudle, uh, Senart, and Risley, Herbert Risley, to argue that, fla uh, that caste actually exhib exhibits much greater fluidity and regional variety than folks in this caste school of racial relations actually uh, allow for. And then uh, a text called Children of Bondage, a study of e educational exclusion by Davis and Dollard, which was published just as the research for Myrtle's two-volume, 1,500-page American Dilemma, which was funded by the Carnegie Corporation, was coming to an end. And then there was the very important ethnography, which was published in uh, 1941, Deep South, which was supervised by Lloyd Warner and researched by Alison Davis, his wife, Elizabeth, and the Gardners, bits of which Myrtle cites. Um, there's another kind of storyline here, too, about the Dunning School, um, the famous or infamous school of history at Columbia University, uh, which also is behind the production of some of the work that I've been talking about, but I'm happy to talk about this later. Um, but I just want to mention that during the 1940s, when these uh, publications are coming out, Ambedkar writes a letter, as we know, um, because I, this is a quite famous you know, historical fact, tidbit, uh, that Ambedkar writes a letter in 1946 to Du Bois requesting copies of a petition uh, 
that um, uh, Du Bois had submitted to the United Nations by black Americans. Identifying himself as a student of the Negro problem who belonged to the untouchables of America, uh, India, Ambedkar asserts that there was so much similarity between the position of untouchables in India and the position of Negroes in America that the study of the latter is not only natural but necessary. Du Bois, as we know, confirms that uh, the National Negro Congress, a small organization, had drafted the statement and that he expected the NAACP to submit a more comprehensive statement. We also know that the UN didn't consider this statement and that this really went nowhere. Du Bois had mentioned, uh, had, had maintained that between 1910 and 1930, he had revolutionized, he argues, the American Negro's attitude to caste. He writes in Souls already in 1903 of social caste, of caste as a barrier, in his 1909 evolution of the race problem, he's already speaking about color caste as structuring both slavery and its aftermath. Color caste, he argues, was entrenched through, through the process of treating free blacks as if they were slaves. And I quote, the caste of color was turned as to correspond with the caste of work and enslave not only slaves, but black men who were not slaves. Du Bois noted, however, that the free Negro had hastened the economic crisis which killed slavery and had made it impossible to make the caste of work and the caste of color correspond. He was, he argues, the promise and the cause of those who forced the critical revolution. It might be good to tarry a while with Du Bois and his idea of the Negro as that peculiar agent of historical transformation. His analysis is both deeper and more profound than the very best scholarship that had been produced under the, sky, under the sign of the caste school of race relations. This, it seems to me, is because he asks the unanswerable question of origins, and because he wants to think of this peculiar historical agent, the Negro, as a problem for thought, as named Chandler has argued in his important text, X. But in the interest of time, it might be worth noting the distinctive use of the term caste in all of these works, one that appears to have seen caste as a way to address the overlapping structures of repulsion, discrimination, exclusion, and inequality. Du Bois was most clear, perhaps, again here, that what was really at issue in thinking about color caste was the social heritage of slavery as an inheritance. So I should be clear already the comparisons also went the other way. Across the 20th century, anti-caste thinkers related struggles for caste equality with global movements for human emancipation. If Indian nationalists and social reformers had provincialized caste as an intensely local form of hierarchy, anti-caste thinkers would already draw on historical comparison between caste and other forms of inequality. This problem has continued into scholarly production. If Western theory has tended to treat caste as a form of non-political difference and a manifestation of hierarchy that contrasts with North Atlantic conceptions of equality, scholars of South Asia have responded by historicizing caste's social pertinence and its analytic centrality. But their efforts have also had the ironic effect of rendering caste into subcontinental difference. We know, for instance, that Jyoti Rao Phule drew on the model of Atlantic world slavery of white and black to mark a historic conflict and a primary contradiction between Brahmin and non-Brahmin, between intellectual and manual labor, and between Aryan invaders versus autochthonous peoples. Ambedkar, constitutional lawyer, thinker and theorist of radical equality, compared the untouchable's position negatively with that of the slave, who was engaged, at least he argued, in value-producing labor. Other pertinent comparisons also followed with minority populations who were the detritus of imperial breakdown and reorganization such as the Jew. But I also want, so I'm, I want to stop for a second and suggest first that we should be careful of such comparison, but also that it's possible that in the context of race biologism on the one hand and the discourse of class and exploitation as a primary way to understand inequality on the other, that caste might have offered more 
to thinkers of race than perhaps the other way around. Ambedkar was clear late in his life, for instance, that caste and race could not be compared, that commensuration actually pointed to its limits, while opening the field of adjacencies and proximities. We see Du Bois doing something similar in his writings on the plight of the Jews when he visits Germany in 1936 and notes that while there are echoes or resonances of the plight of the Jew and the Negro, they cannot be reduced or rendered equivalent under National Socialism and Jim Crow, respectively. Indeed, by the mid to late 1930s, National Socialism, coming back to our global frame uh, and thinking about imperial breakdown and transformation, National Socialism coupled with changes in the philosophy and strategy of Congress nationalism in India and the practice of Gandhianism created real resistance to thinking caste through race. And by the 1940s, Ambedkar's many experiments, he had utilized the colonial mechanisms for producing parity between communities. He had sought occasional alliance with communists. He had been inspired by the legislation of race as civic disability in understanding the social exclusions of caste and in his thinking of caste boycott as the enforcement of what he would call illegal law, and in that sense drawing on the kind of American history of the legal uh, legislation of, of race. And he had formed solidarities with the Muslim minority. Each of these he would feel by the 1940s had ended in some kind of betrayal. Ambedkar's texts, Thoughts on Pakistan, written in 1941, and Pakistan or the Partition of India in 45 marks the culmination of his reflections on the linked fate of Dalits and Muslims as non-Hindu minorities, and his simultaneous awareness of their histories of difference shaped by the problem of sovereignty. In the second edition of his Pakistan, or the Partition of India, published in 45, Ambedkar, by his own admission, underscores the singular nature of his enterprise, and indeed, the fact that it had fallen on deaf ears by noting that this was a book that was disowned by Hindus and unowned by the Muslims, and that this had only emboldened his own claim to nonpartisanship in order to think, in a sense, non-ideologically, if you will, about the question of Pakistan. And I think uh, one really should think about Ambedkar as one of the first philosophers of the idea of Pakistan. Um, he traces the transformation of Muslim demands from minority protection within the nation to their arguments for a separate nation dispassionately, noting that while majority and minority existed as entities within the nation, the nation form itself was organized around affective bonds and the feeling of commonality. And indeed, the two texts on Pakistan um, recognize, and I think quite dispassionately, that what, the Muslim, uh, what Muslims in India had managed to do was indeed to think about nationality through, the, through these affective bonds of commonality. And uh, there is there also, I suppose, uh, mourning the impossibility of being able to do so for Dalits as well. This is also an important global moment going back uh, just a little bit to, to the 30s and the 40s. And I want to suggest that if we see the mature Du Bois embracing communism in this time, think of that magnum opus, Black Reconstruction, then Ambedkar's writings after 1935 and 36, after uh, his magnum opus, Annihilation of Caste, published in 36, charts a path towards his eventual Buddhist conversion. And so even as, in a sense, you know, Du Bois in the 30s and beyond is kind of moving out into the world and really taking up the arguments that he's been making um, from the early teens uh, about thinking through the question of the global color line, of thinking about color caste and empire. We see, it seems to me, Ambedkar beginning to kind of move inwards and moving in his late writings towards the question of history and towards the question of Buddhism. So if Black Reconstruction signaled a turning point in Du Bois's thinking, so did the Annihilation of Caste mark this turning point. Two texts published uh, within a year, uh, and what unites these otherwise disparate texts is their author's discovery of the logic governing a social order, race and Hinduism, respectively. Du Bois had preferred to the hardening of the caste system when he associated the failure of emancipation with the rise of racial capitalism and the emergence of a white and black proletariat. The annihilation of caste posited the intractability of untouchability of reform when conceived within Gandhian rubrics 
of an ethicized Hinduism capable of doing justice to the untouchable, figured by Gandhi as Harijan. In the extended debate with Gandhi that his text inaugurated, Ambedkar argued that the abolition of caste was impossible without annihilating Hinduism, since caste and Hinduism were mutually entailed. As earlier efforts to specify the civic disability of caste gave way to a concern with the past in Ambedkar's late writing, he began to argue that the Dalit was a subject of historical violence, a form of remaindered life produced by the epochal conflict between Buddhism and Brahmanism. The outcast was the excluded insider simultaneously within and with, without Hindu society, one which was organized around the unbridgeable line between the touchables and the untouchables. In his late writings on the history of caste and untouchability, as well as in a text written in 1954, which was titled Revolution and Counter-Revolution in Ancient India, Ambedkar analyzes Brahmanism as a form of rule and as a practice of sovereignty. He argues there that reactionary casteist forces had vanquished a vibrant egalitarian world of Buddhism by killing the Buddhist king, Pushyamitra, 185 um, BCE. Unlike Islam, which was more recent, Ambedkar will argue, and which was framed as a matter of competitive sovereignty between Hindus and Muslims, both had been rulers, caste relationship to Brahmanism and Brahmanism's intimacy with state power was ancient, pervasive, but also forgotten. And it's here that Ambedkar writes that the history of India is nothing but a history of mortal conflict between Buddhism and Brahmanism. I'm going to just make a quick um, um, detour um, or a segue from this. Uh, this 1954 text, Revolution and Counter-Revolution, reminds us of a text that Ambedkar would argue stayed with him throughout his life. And this is his 1916 text, Castes in India, their mechanisms, genesis, and uh, development. Right. And uh, this text, Cast in India 1916, written while he was at Columbia, does something quite interesting. And it goes back to this question of the conversation between caste and race. Because they're uh, drawing on Weber, Ambedkar will make first the argument that caste is an enclosed class. And therefore, it's very difficult to actually think through what makes caste specific. And second, he says that if there is a logic of differentiation that organizes race and caste, then it's quite interesting to think about their difference. Right? Race endogamy, the fact that there is no miscegenation across the color line, is a consequence, he will argue, of racial segregation. But in India, and this is something that he holds throughout his life, which makes it difficult for him to embrace Foulet's argument, for instance, of a kind of historic racial conflict between Brahmins and non-Brahmins, but in the context of caste, Ambedkar will argue, caste exists <coughs> despite a kind of racial or national amalgamation. He resists strongly the idea that different castes are racially distinct. So this poses a very particular question for him to explain what it is that actually produces caste as such and what creates differences between castes, right? The idea that castes cannot intermarry, do not practice intimacy and social intercourse. And it's here then that Ambedkar actually draws on the relationship between sexual order and the primacy of the sexual ordering of caste as a way to think about its social reproduction. And he will argue that there is a complex relationship between endogamy and exogamy in the way that castes are organized, and that there was actually a question of how to practice endogamy, how to make sure that castes actually didn't relate with each other. Um, through, especially through sexual intimacy. And it's here that he goes towards an argument about gender and gender signification by arguing that the structuring of this order had to do with the ways in which the caste economy, the economy of caste, actually deals with surplus men and surplus women. Right? And that what we have, and this is a statistical argument, and it's an argument also about the violence of caste, right? That actually, uh, even as child marriage was a way to deal with the question of surplus men, surplus women were merely killed off, right? And therefore, the practice of sati and so on and so forth. And so this becomes very interesting because what Ambedkar seems then to be arguing is not so much that sex or sexuality is prior, but that caste is prior and that it is caste that gives to gender 
its kind of social pertinence, but perhaps also its legibility. But anyway, be that as it may, I just wanted to sort of go off on this detour that it's, it's interesting to think about the moments when Ambedkar is actually trying to think uh, comparatively, if you will, or in a connected fashion about race and caste, and the places where he also rejects this, right? He rejects this late in life, but then we could go back and look at caste in India also as trying to distinguish the specificity of caste from race. So to return to this 1954 text, as I've said, you know, he discovers here a kind of, you know, millennial agon, right? The relationship between Brahmanism and Buddhism, as he argues, is actually structuring Indian history to core. So his conversion, when it happens in 1956, was meant to activate the historical memory of Buddhism's disappearance in the land of its birth. Buddhism, Ambedkar had begun to argue, was coeval in status with Hinduism, but superior to it in form and substance. Its absence in India was actually proof of Brahmanism's dominance. But Buddhism was an Indic religion whose authority no one could challenge, since it preceded the establishment of organized or Puranic Hinduism. And it's very interesting uh, that, uh, that Ambedkar and I think many others uh, subcontinental thinkers are really thinking about Buddhism and Islam and you know Hinduism appears almost as a kind of secondary space um, but they're really thinking through this question of Buddhism and Islam as animating and structuring um, its relationship to, to Hinduism and that that's the space that we actually need to be thinking about. Uh, but in any case the epistemic space then that Ambedkar had claimed through Buddhist conversion was ingenious and unassailable. But the Navayana, or the new vehicle Buddhism that he established, was in effect a godless religion, not legible to extant traditions. Ambedkar's conversion then did not only offer an escape from Hinduism, but it also underscored the singular circumstance of his response. For what Ambedkar managed to do was to restage caste difference as a religious difference, Buddhism versus Brahmanism, that was both familiar and new. A conversation that one assumed had already occurred in the millennial past, but the contents of which were in fact to be decided in the future to come. I don't really have an ending, uh, but to end here, um, I think I would go back in a sense to that, um, to that opening quote by Judith Butler, um, which makes a, an argument about a kind of radical claim on the universal, um, and poses this question of, you know, what happens when we think the universal from the space of the contaminated subject, right? The minority subject who is differently minoritized um, but, and the circumstances of that minoritization, I'm trying to suggest being both historically specific, but also it seems to me commensurable, um, but within limits. And so I'll leave in a sense with this problem of the minority subject and her question uh, to uh, us in the 20th and the 21st century, which is about how to relate this question of embodiment and the universal and how to activate that relationship, it seems to me, anew um, under any given uh, set of circumstances or conjunctures so that the Dalit then becomes, we could also say, good to think. Right? And it's possible that somebody else stands in the place of. So as we were talking about sexual minorities and so on, it's possible that someone else stands in the place of this particular political subject. Um, and so we could read this, I suppose, both as a historically specific argument, um, but also perhaps as an argument that is good to think with in terms of where we want to go um, in activating precisely this kind of problematic. So I'll stop there. Absolutely, yeah, I'd love to. Please? <laughs> so, uh, sorry, uh, I just had a day where I talked about class, the water classes, the something is coming from that. I want to pick up on the idea of contamination mm -hmm. and to see to the extent and limits of an analogizing class to other concepts. So, um, so, there is the idea of contamination that I mean, of, of, of ritual purity, of uh, a certain kind of um, um, 
pristineness that is attached mm -hmm. to uh, both the imagination of caste and its sort of spatial organization. Mm -hmm. um, when and this is sort of thinking doing something about the Bhagavad when we sort of look at um, the, the, the the, the, is that something that travels to other spaces? Uh, and, and one example I think of in terms of fuel populations of mixed race groups, there are ways in that that they get located within a kind of racial hierarchy mm. where similar things don't happen with Dalits and caste groups. It's not um, leading to a certain kind of space in the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that when you use contamination, yeah, you meant sort of yep. in terms of categories, but there mm -hmm. is a kind of physical element. This sure, sure. Uh, which, when there are political moves to then analogize it to race and national framework, don't always get captured. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, you know, I mean, there's, there's, I suppose, two ways, or one could respond to this from two ends, as it were, right? So one would be if, you know, one is to think from the perspective of precisely those groups that you're talking about, then um, it calls up a particular history where we would have to say, well, what do we do? And in some very real sense, what do we do with the question of indenture? What do we do with the way in which indenture becomes a kind of intermediary moment, if you will, if you want to think through, on the one hand, the question of slavery, slavery both as uh, kind of metaphorized, right, in Fule and so on, but real Atlantic world plantation slavery on the one hand, and then the question of, of freedom and equality, right? So where in that kind of continuum would you place something like indenture in real historical time, if I can put it that way. And then you really do have to think through, it seems to me, those spaces. You have to think through the Caribbean. You need to think through South Africa. You need to think through the very particular ways in which, for instance, the question of you know Indians and Africans and so on really gets figured. And there, it seems to me, the question becomes quite it, it's, it's a difficult one. I mean, it's, I'm not somebody who is an expert on those spaces, but I would say that you know it becomes a very difficult one um, because the kinds of um, forgetting then that are called that are required, and then the other modes of acknowledgement really are transformed, right? And so there, perhaps you know, um, th th there is there is real proximity, there is real intimacy. It produces something quite distinctive. It produces new family forms and new family formations. Um, and then maybe some some bit of the question that you're asking about contamination and so on gets relocated to some, you know odd notion of a kind of domestic interior, its relationship to homeland, and so on. I'm just speculating, but, but it seems to me that you know, that would be one way to think through this question of contamination. Um, but you know, from the other end of things, I mean, you're sort of asking how broadly can we think the question of, of a kind of um, a ritual contamination, one that's not about stigmatized or degraded labor and so on. That's what I'm understanding, and, and how much does that you know, how much does that travel? Um, the immediate response, I suppose, would be to say no. Um, but then it seems to me that, you know, you also want to think about sort of orders of repulsion and orders of abjection. And uh, it doesn't have to be a kind of ritual notion of contamination, where at some level, if you think about it, the Brahmin is as untouchable as, uh, as the untouchable, right? Yeah. This is the kind of argument, for instance, that Gopal Guru and Sundar Saruka and so forth make and really capitalize on in, um, in Cracked Mirror, that you know, there is a kind of order where untouchability can be episodic and transient, and then there is the permanent outcasting. And Ambedkar is also quite clued in to, to all of this. So there, I suppose, the question is, is, is almost about sort of the, the, the body and different ways in which questions of repulsion, abjection, stigma relate to the body. Um, and and um, there it seems to me that one could think uh, a little bit more comparatively or maybe at least imaginatively to think through um, you know, different ways of parsing that. Um, but again, you know, I mean, this is sort of off, off the top of my head. Uh, in thinking about uh, in thinking about this, but uh, it seems to me that we shouldn't sort of restrict ourselves to thinking about contamination in the way that you're um, asking about it. Um, it inheres. It, uh, it it is replayed. It seems to me, or it's it gets remembered in things like caste violence, archaic forms of violence, right, where you have caste violence that is both profoundly modern, 
but is always harking back to notions of the body, its dismemberment, where the body belongs, what kinds of spaces it should be in. So many of the kind of the repertoires, if you will, of caste violence also end up remarking <coughs> through the mutilated body of Dalits and so on. Kerlanji did this very explicitly, right? It, it actually remakes the boundaries, as it were, of a village order and, new f and, and forms of sociality in and through the dismembered body of, uh, of Dalit men and women. And, and so that kind of a signification, I suppose, does require reading and reading specifically. Um, but we could also, it seems to me, think through um, family resemblances rather than comparison or direct you know, analogies, but maybe at least sort of family resemblances, things calling up things, lynching, right, and so on and so forth. And to that extent, it's ritual. To that extent, it's about contamination, but about very specific historical orders as well. Um, so yeah. Yeah. So a couple of thank you for such a rich talk. There's you. so many um, levels here and I think it's fascinating <laughs> about the project. Um, so I wanted to uh, I mean one thread that sort of came out is the way you talk about the ways that caste gets very fast uh, as mm -hmm. a as non political difference. Mm -hmm. This is a really rich question, so thank you for that. I'll try to do justice to at least maybe some portion of it, and then let me know if, um, if you know there are other bits of it, because there are sort of two parts to the question that you asked. Um, one, you know, about the relationship between caste and Hinduism, um, very differently imagined, of course, by Ambedkar and Gandhi. And then the second is about comparative religion. I'm very excited about the comparative religion par part of your question, so I want to try to sort of answer that um, uh, by elaborating on this on this issue of Buddhism. Right? Because I think absolutely people are reading comparative religion. But the other thing to also think about, I mean, Ambedkar is a person in his time, even if his thought kind of exceeds it. And so one of the things that we're seeing, for instance, with the, uh, with the argument about Buddhism, is the extent to which you know, there are kind of two, maybe even three different strains of what's happening with the rediscovery of Buddhism at this time. One is coming, and Ambedkar is not part of this, but one is really coming from, uh, from, from the south, from the Tamil country. And the very long tradition, especially of the Pariyar community and their relationship to histories of Jainism and Buddhism. So we should remember that you know, Ambedkar sort of writes the foreword to Lakshmi Narsu's Essence of Buddhism, and Lakshmi Narsu himself is part of a long tradition of Tamil Dalit Buddhism. Right? And that's a kind of, you know, and, and that's a, a different kind of a genealogy, right? Um, but, you know, but then there's something else that's also happening, which is the ways in which, um, coming back to comparative religion, one would be to think comparatively about Hinduism, the argument about monotheism, many gods, you know, but, you know, one, one kind of substance or essence and so on. But the fact that, you know, uh, at the very same time that we're having that kind of a conversation in comparative religion about Hinduism, we've also got the rediscovery of Buddhism, right? And so in many ways, Ambedkar's argument about the Buddhist homeland as a kind of unavailable space for Buddhism, right? So Buddhism is, is here, there are signs of it, but it no longer exists. And you know, Ambedkar does this by going back and trying to argue that the Dalit actually is the kind of remaindered subject and the uh, enduring remnant and reminder of a kind of Buddhism that had been vanquished. And he connects that with an argument about the cow and about beef, and very interesting thinking about what's happening today with, with lynchings and so on. Um, and so, so, you know, there's, there's that kind of an argument that he makes. 
But the other, um, in terms of the rediscovery of Buddhism, is people like um, Dharmapala, Anagarika Dharmapala, but also people like Sankirtyayan, Dharmanand Kosambi, right, uh, Didi's father, who converts. Sankirtyayan is a Buddhist and then becomes a Marxist. And so you've got sort of, you know, people who are also on a very different search for what I would call, you know, I mean, if you can think about a kind of Islamic universality, speaking about that period, Khilafat, even the argument about the subcontinent as the space for Islam, you know, new scholarship, Shahab Ahmed, etc., but also the argument that people like Iqbal and others are making. We're seeing an argument about Buddhism also as that kind of a universality, yet with a different notion of its geographical spread. That's why I said, you know, Islam, Buddhism become very interesting to think about in terms of our conversation about Hinduism. So all of this is happening, and it's kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's the um, predecessor, if you will, for what Ambedkar is doing. And so what, I'm, what I think briefly I, I would just want to suggest is that you know, it's not that Ambedkar is not picking up on some of these arguments about you know, Edwin Arnold's you know, Light on Asia, the rediscovery of Buddhism as a counter even to Hinduism, where that argument about Buddhism as a kind of civic religion goes. Many people are doing this. Ambedkar comes to this with his own special kind of twist very much like you know, I've tried to argue that Du Bois is also swimming in the waters of you know the caste school of race relations and so on. But he does something that is quite extraordinary and distinctive, and perhaps that's why we want to think of these people as political philosophers, political thinkers. Um, you know, uh, but I'll, I'll put myself out on uh, out on a limb by saying that. So I think there is that world um, that Ambedkar is kind of channeling and receiving, but he's doing something, he's taking it somewhere else. So I hope that answers your question about comparative religion. And um, there's lots to say, there's lots more to say. I mean, there's Dharmapala and the, I mean, in a way, uh, the, the kind of cleansing of a kind of Buddhism that happens through the Mahabodhi society, right? Because the Mahabodhi society is in Sri Lanka, they moved to Calcutta and so on. And then the other kind of cleansing that's happening is through people like Suzuki and others, right? Where they want to actually think about Buddhism as philosophy, and they want to do away with the whole history of Buddhist religiosity, popular religiosity. So I think there's something quite interesting that, that's going on, and I think one should be critical in that sense of the kind of minimal Buddhism that Ambedkar also produces. It seems to me it's part and parcel of those kinds of practices as much as it is the reading of Navayana Buddhism and a new history of the Dalit. So, you know, I'd, I'd sort of leave that there. Um, your other question about sort of caste and Hinduism and Gandhi and Ambedkar, I mean, what to say? Uh, yes, caste must go uh, and, and Hinduism cannot, cannot be redeemed. I mean, this would be, it seems to me, Ambedkar's argument. Um, but that argument about, you know, sort of caste annihilation, I mean, if, um, or let me, I, I would put this in a slightly different way. I think that that move of Ambedkar's after the 32 conversation and the conflict with Gandhi uh, is actually a response to a question that Gandhi poses that he can't answer. Because I think Gandhi actually poses the question. I mean, he essentially says, you know, what, what, what is it that you want, right? And can you actually operate in a purely kind of political space, if you will, without the notion of a kind of ethicized religion, if you will, a practice of spirituality, you know, I don't know what you want to call it. But I think Gandhi poses that really profound question and it produces a kind of dilemma, it seems to me, for Ambedkar. And he has to answer that question in the way that he will, which is the angry, insurgent, incredibly lo logical sort of extraordinary response that he produces in 36 with the annihilation of caste. Um, but I don't know if it's a, it's a question that is, that is kind of resolved. I mean, one loves the argument about caste annihilation and the annihilation of, of Hinduism. I mean, <laughs> one is drawn to it, I suppose, um, both kind of politically and, and, and philosophically in some sense. But, you know, the, the kind of deeper integuments, you know, in terms of the conversation either with Gandhi or quote unquote Hinduism or where is Buddhism here, I think is a little bit more open. Um, but I don't know if that, that responds to, yeah. Mm-hmm. 
That is, it's a kind of post Ambedkar question you're asking. A little bit, maybe yeah, not yeah. Ambedkar. I mean, you mentioned that Ambedkar was yeah. interested in, I mean, I've always been thinking about this, and um, I was for us, Harry, as well, about this <laughs> question about where Ambedkar really, where Ambedkar and vice versa in America, people really think about um, reservations or quotas yeah. Yeah. based on race. Because it seems to me it's not an, it's not clear who comes first and where the thinking comes right, about right, it. Right, right, right. Because they're quite. In fact, if they're practicing India first, as you say, from certain colonial genealogy. Yep, yep. Um, but yeah, so, so thinking of remedial and reformist, actually, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. even if people analytically think caste and race are different, people obviously have political solidarities and pro projects of reform that could overlap. Sure, that don't, sure. That don't require an analytic, absolute mm -hmm, overlap mm -hmm, in terms mm -hmm. of Mm -hmm. No, and I think, you know, I mean, and, and the important question in a sense that you're asking also because, and we talked about this earlier today, that, you know, some of this work is kind of thinking um, about thought uh, in, in its non-relation, as it were, to the question of the state, right? And, and so I think your question in a sense of, you know, what might be other ways to think about this becomes a question in the 40s and the 50s about policy design. And it becomes a question of the relationship between state and minority, right? That final text of Ambedkar's as well on state and minorities. And so I think there the question of kind of, you know, um, remediation, if you will, is, is not this kind of a project, which is, you know, imagining a kind of political future that is experimental, that is interruptive, that is uh, kind of profoundly insurgent, if you, you know, whatever term you want, but it's really thinking through the question of actual social entitlements and the question of the state. And there I think it becomes very difficult to, to, to say. I mean, I've always maintain the colonial genealogy because it seems to me that there you can go from the 1880s onwards and you know whenever I teach I'm always telling people well you know it's a century before 1965 that India is actually dealing with the question of reservations but the question of reservations of course in India is a complicated one because it becomes a question of proportional representation not of minority representation and then it has to move towards uh, reservations as we know it uh, with you know the scheduled caste becoming the modal subject but then kind of you know everything moving out and developing out from that project also in the constitution but we could, I suppose, think, I mean, one way, and this was the way that, to me, which, which I like, uh, would be to think about the kind of colonial genealogy, um, if we're thinking about kind of colonial genealogies of thought, it seems to me we could also think about colonial genealogies of sort of political instruments, right? So the ethnic electorate, the separate electorate, um, reservations, uh, the question of mandate, the question that gets posed of two nation, one territory. I mean, all of these are experiments that are a profound challenge to the question of empire nation that we inherit in terms of the European genealogy of the state, right, and state form into the 20th century and beyond. Um, so that part of it, I suppose, one could, one could argue. Ambedkar is beginning to do this, but then you have a, an, a very interesting problematic. So you see him, for instance, in the START Committee and so on. And he'll have these conversations about the caste boycott. But then when he makes an argument about boycott and caste boycott, the terms that he's using could be Plessy versus Frank, you know? So then it's the argument about public, uh, public amenities and public access. 
And then you're sort of like, okay, yes, we know you were sitting in the United States. <laughs> you know, did that come from there? So I think that vice versa, I think it is very hard to kind of figure out where those, um, maybe where some of those histories lie. Um, and, and it seems to me, I mean, just kind of as a simple response, that much more needs to be done on actually the way in which the question of public amenities develops out of a common law tradition, right? A kind of British common law tradition. And that, that it seems to me, is actually where we can begin to see something of a kind of early sense of civic disability, civic redress, remediation, and then that gets kind of writ large. And I mean, Rohit can say far better than I, it seems to me, that that then gets uh, you know, written out and expanded and elaborated in the 40s and the 50s. But, um, but yeah, I mean, there would be that. There's, um, I think there's also, I mean, there's an interesting and weird way in which we've not thought about other spaces. You know, we've not thought of something like, you know, Malaysia. We don't think about South Africa. You know, we don't think about, again, all of those experiments that are happening 30s, 40s, 50s, and beyond. And, and the extent to which, in a sense, South Africa is both the kind of pariah state, you know, belated, you know, the entire world is decolonizing and they're instituting apartheid. <laughs> but surely there, there's an interesting genealogy of the ethnic electorate to be followed up too, right? So, um, so yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, you know, I think your, your question, in, in a sense, to circle back to what I said, that this question of the state is one that I think we do have to think about. You know, Ambedkar is not, you know, ex A, neither does he want to annihilate the state. He wants to annihilate caste, but not the state. And neither does he, in a sense, not want to tarry with the state. And so that problem, in a sense, of the 40s and the 50s, I think, is also the foreclosure of the earlier openings. And it goes back to his thinking, well, Muslims and Dalits, you know, we create solidarity oh, maybe there's some other way for me to parse this in a colonial imperial frame where I have other allies outside of the subcontinent. And all of those things actually become impossible. And he has to transact with the state in the way that you're asking, I think. Mm -hmm. And slave societies are often become attenuated to a U.S. American yeah. model. And I'm wondering to what extent um, Baker's own sort of hmm. thinking about um, slavery, about the U.S., is itself problematic because it cannot deal with the kind of many manifestations of race itself, sure. right, across different geographical areas, so that the comparison then becomes very sticky to yeah. certain locations, geographical locations, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in particular bodies, sure. not others. Sure. No, and I mean, in a sense, this goes back, or it has a lot of resonance, I think, also with the question that maybe Rohit was asking, right? Um, look, I mean, it's it's a little difficult for me. I mean, you know, because. I do Ambedkar, and then you know I know I know uh, in a sense and engage um, African American political thought. So to think about kind of you know uh, deprovincializing race, right, and in a sense removing it from this very particular history that we have of a kind of Atlantic world formation and so on and so forth does become really difficult. As I've said, Ambedkar himself is a, is a thinker of his time as well as, as much as he is sort of outside of it. And I think, you know, whether you're thinking about the way that he's using colonial ethnography or that very interesting way in which he's trying to think through the question of slavery and caste, um, th th there, there's a kind of, um, th there's, there's a lack of flexibility, I suppose. There's a lack of historicization. Right, we know he's talking about Aptiker and so on, but it's not as if he's really thinking in that sense about a kind of full-blown comparison. I think the, the, it's also strategic because it allows him to do certain things. So I don't know if you know. It, it, I don't know if Ambedkar becomes the person in some sense through whom we want to think about whether there's a more expansive notion, as it were, of thinking uh, the race question. I mean, it actually might be more interesting to think about someone like Periyar. <laughs> 
right? And, you know, his many peregrinations. I mean, he is a global subject too. We've not really talked about this. But, you know, there's an interesting way in which, and also because for him, uh, you know, the question of, of, of kind of... Um, social life in the domain of, of what we might think of now as kind of civil society is the place that is most interesting and important for him. Um, you could think about somebody like that, maybe even someone like Gandhi, who has a more interesting and expansive notion, perhaps, of the way that race is operating, certainly in the first part of his life, because he is a South African thinker as much as he is an Indian one, it seems to me. Um, so to that extent, I guess, um, you know, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, one could be critical, I suppose, of Ambedkar. If you were to say, what, are, what is a more globally ramified or, or, or more socially complete, yeah, yeah, or a more socially kind of, you know, complex and complete way to think about it, I really would come back to, I think, also this question of indenture. That, you know, if we think of a certain kind of counter-global history that thinks through slavery and dehumanization, then that logic of, and, and we're thinking about a kind of colonial capital, a logic of colonial capitalism or imperial capital and so on, then I think we might have to think about the actual other spaces that are really, you know, within the field of a more expansive way of thinking race. Um, and again, race perhaps in the way that someone like Foucault will suggest it, right? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a form of kind of repulsion. It's a form of differentiation. Um, and X marks the spot. It can be gendered. It can be truly from. It, it can be about uh, chromatism, as it were. It can be about ritual practices. It can be about other orders of extimacy as opposed to intimacy. But that one could think race also a racism, in that sense, as a as a constantly activated form of differentiation, and you can cut that social fabric any which way you will. So two ways to think it, right? One through a kind of historically more expansive way of thinking race racism in the 1920th century, and maybe in terms of a kind of political philosophy thinking racism right, as a kind of engagement between or the paradoxical engagement between equality and difference, right? the dialectic, and that racism becomes in that sense a kind of uh, almost a kind of uh, necessary outgrowth of, of that, <laughs> that machine, that identity difference kind of machine, if you will, um, or equality difference machine. Thank you. Thank you. So Thank you. Yeah.